So I'm back here with Dr. Connor Wood. We're today going to talk about fundamentally music and dancing and drumming, or what we could say call synchrony. So just jumping right into it, what is synchrony? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Andrew. It's good to be here. Um, synchrony is the use of rhythm in, in, in groups, um, things like clapping in time together, or marching in time, singing, anything where there's a, a shared collective rhythm that we're moving in time to. So drumming, you know, uh, hand drumming in, in West Africa, for example, perfect example of synchrony. So, um, and, and this is, this is uh, something that humans do a lot of, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the foundation for music, the ability to keep a rhythm together and other animals don't do it. You don't, you'll, you'll never see a group of dogs on the side of a street all kind of- and Tapping their feet yeah, together or something, yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't happen. And uh, so, so part, of the, part of the research I've been doing over the past few years has been to kind of investigate what's going on sort of from an evolutionary perspective. Why is it that we have this ability? Why do we do this? Um, what's, how does this distinct, distinguish us from other animals? You know, and it has it? huge implications for religion specifically. Like this is re religion for breakfast after all, but so much of religious ritual globally and historically revolves around synchrony, whether it's dancing together. You know, I just recently did a video on Haitian voodoo and like their ceremonies are essentially music parties, you yeah. know, drumming, dancing. Uh, and then when we think of even a more uh, in like a Protestant setting where you're singing hymns or an evangelical setting where you have a rock band going like music yeah. is part and parcel of religious ritual for for as long as human history. So this it just goes hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of people believe that that the earliest sort of religious rituals were were, were dancing, you know, around uh, a fire, or whatever, you know. That, that's just this. That's probably the what rituals looked like um, early on in in our history. So, yeah, it's 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 really key to a lot of rituals, um, but it's it's not the only thing that happens in rituals, right? Like there's there's other things. That go on. So if you if you go to a Catholic mass, you'll see some synchrony. People will be singing. There might be maybe a, a choir. There might be re, you know reciting the Lord's Prayer, or the Creed, uh, all in unison, which is a kind of synchrony. You know you have to actually kind of keep a rhythm going, in order to be able to speak it in, in in at the same time. But there's also a lot of stuff that happens where people are doing different things at different times. You know, the, the priest is doing something, somebody else is like maybe swinging a censer and, you know, or if you've ever been to an Orthodox service, right? Um, you know, there's, there can be lots of people doing lots of different things right. all at the same time. Um, so there's, there's some aspects of ritual that don't have synchrony. And I'm, I'm emphasizing that because I think it's important um, for, for illustrating what synchrony is about. That and then there's other parts where where synchrony is really really important, and one um, one anthropologist Harvey Whitehouse at Oxford talks about the the this kind of difference between um, rituals that are really sort of ecstatic, you know, maybe focused on music. A great example would be uh, Haitian voodoo. Mm -hmm. Um, with, I mean, those dances go all night long. You know, you're you're and the drumming um, is constant. So so that's a good example of something that's ecstatic and music driven. And then there's also uh, more, more uh, routinized or, or uh, doctrinal sort of rituals, which is what he, so he, he calls one kind imagistic and the other kind of doctrinal. The doctrinal rituals are more like a Protestant, you know, service on a Sunday morning where it's pretty relax, you know, pretty, pretty staid pretty maybe. Staid, yeah. yeah. And, and there's some singing, but there's a lot of standing still and that kind of thing. Um, and it's more about kind of learning, a do like reinforcing a doctrine or beliefs, whereas the, the more ecstatic rituals are kind of more about like expressing things or, or even undergoing different kinds of trance states, mm -hmm. you know? And the most rituals of actually, I think kind of have a little bit of both, you know, at least collective rituals, you know, where you've got a congregation of people um, together um, but the, the, the musical part is something that it, it bonds people together. There's actually a lot of research showing that when people are 
in rhythm together, you know, clapping or drumming or whatever, it causes um, it causes a big increase in trust and willingness to kind of cooperate and sacrifice for one another, and uh, a strong increase in the feeling of being kind of part of the same group or unit. And so synchronized ritual and has a very real effect, a yeah. very immediate effect. We're not talking like societal, but like in a community, in a single church building or a single dance around a fire, like it is doing something yeah. in that community. Yeah, exactly. Even on like the physiological level, it's it's making people, it, it helps people to release um, pain killing endorphins. Um, there's one interesting study um, Emma Cohen, who's a psychologist, showed that people who row, you know, doing like on a rowing machine, if, mm -hmm. if they row in time together, then, um, then they have more cooperative feelings afterwards. But if they do the same motion, but kind of like not on the same rhythm, it's not the same effect. And, and other research has shown that rowing in time together also causes, you know, causes an a increase in pain tolerance, which means that there's endorphins kind of flowing. Um, so, so there's, you're right that there's something really physically happening right there. And that's another aspect of the imagistic mode that's, that's important is that it's really about the local community bonding people tightly, um, whereas the doctrinal sort of more, more formal sort of ritual is about, is about kind of cognitively connecting yourself with a broader, mm -hmm. um, world religion or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's let's i mean we immediately got into the topic of religion but let's think more broadly and and maybe even evolutionarily like what what does synchrony and music and rhythm like how how has that played into human development like we the, the video that we're going to be making here we might title it like the origin of music like why why music so yeah. let's think more broadly like why yeah um and that's 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 a big question for a lot of people in, in comparative musicology and evolutionary biology right now uh, because it's, it is such an unusual thing to do. Um, one kind of going theory is that it's for social bonding. You know, we're, we're the most social large mammal there is. We absolutely depend on each other to live in a way that chimpanzees don't, you know, a, a chimpanzee would be able to survive alone in the wild for, for much longer than we would um, because, you know, I don't know how to make a car engine. You don't know how to make a, a, a microprocessor, whatever, you know, that, that we just all depend on each other for all this knowledge and these, this ability to hang together. And without those connections, without that sort of like social solidarity, that starts to fall apart, that cooperation, that, and, and, and so it's a survival imperative to be able to have these strong groups with, with tight bonds. And so one going theory is that music is an, adapt, an adaptation for bonding, that it allows us to um, enter into the same non-technical word, headspace together, but also emotional space, right? You, you, it, it directly affects emotions um, and, and releases reward chemicals in the brain, activates the reward system to, to be in synchrony with other people. So it's a way of coordinating with each other that's, that's actually pretty simple because it's based on a, on a regular beat. My, my own take on it and in in the research I've been doing um, is that that, is, that simplicity is actually really important because we coordinate with each other all the time. That's absolutely central to being human is that we are able to do what um, one anthropologist, Michael Tomasello calls uh, shared intentionality, joint intentionality. We can, we can both direct each other's attention to a third thing and say like, hey, I can say like, hey, can you hand me the hammer? And you know that I know that you know that we're both like thinking about the hammer and what it's for, and it's for a goal that we're both working towards building a shed or whatever, and a house. And that's that already. That's more complicated than most animals um, can can do. You know, they can't. It, it, if if you try try pointing out something to another animal, and they'll mostly look at your finger. They won't. It's not. It's not cognitively available to them to have a, tr a, a triangular kind of shape for our interaction where it's two people, two minds directed towards a third thing together 
focusing together. Right. So we have this ability to kind of have a shared intentionality and that allows us to coordinate our actions, our actual, like what our bodies are doing. So if we're, you know, maybe if, if you're working at an, uh, an embassy and I want to go get a passport, you know, then I, I hand you my paperwork, you pick it up. There's actually like a level of physical coordination going on, but it's pretty complicated. You have to be thinking at a pretty high level. Yeah. Versus synchronizing a beat is not technically difficult. Difficult. Like no. it doesn't require the, the massive amount of technology. Unless you're a Protestant. Then yeah. maybe. <laughs> maybe. Okay. But you know, like tapping a stick against a log, we can, we can think of some human in Paleolithic times. You know, they didn't yet invent oboes and orchestras and harpsichords, but they could smack a stick against a rock. And I can imagine like a societal level of um, uh, evolution where like this benefited our society. So we're going to pass this down and it's going to benefit, you know, eventually, you know, religious institutions to, to do music and synchrony and rhythm together yeah yeah exactly and and because it, it does bond us you know it makes us feel like we're we're and we're not just coordinating we're coordinating in a way that's kind of fun and that's that's another really key difference is that music is in, because it's intrinsically rewarding you know when you hear a groovy beat it's kind of hard not to move your your body and that's actually because when when we hear a beat we actually, our brains have to construct the rhythm. It's not, um, if, if a dog, if you're playing music to a, your dog, not that you have a dog, but if you had a dog, right? I don't know if you had a dog, but okay, yeah. So if you, if you play, a, a, you know, even the, the, the fattest beat to a dog, right? Then the dog actually, it's not even that they can't synchronize to it, they can't hear it. They, they just hear, uh, they hear noise. We don't, I mean, you can't imagine exactly what they would hear, but they do not hear that regular doom, 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 because that's, that's a, a psychological event that's happening in your brain as it's reconstructing the noise that's coming in. It has, it's a predict, it's a predictive thing. It's a prediction that your brain's doing. It starts, here's the regularity. It then forms a model in your brain of like, okay, this is a beat that happens every, you know, seven, ten, this often, da dun da dun da dun da dun And then it actually predicts it forward. So it's that prediction that allows you to kind of hear the whole, like the totality of the beat. The way that the brain creates that prediction is by um, basically, what's the word I'm looking for? Drafting, you know, mm -hmm. conscripting the motor system. So it, it, it uses parts of the brain that are, are originally designed for controlling our, our bodies, you know, our motor behavior. And it, it internally, it uses those parts of the brain to simulate a beat. So when you hear a rhythm, your brain's actually simulating it internally. Um, and that sends microbursts of, of uh, potential activity out to the, to the peripheral um, parts of the nervous system. So you're actually, your body's actually primed to move. You cannot hear a beat without your body being ready to move to it. And that's why when you're on the train or whatever and you're listening to music, you might find that you're bobbing your head even without noting it, you know, or you might yeah. see somebody who's just kind of tapping their foot to what they're listening to. And they, it's, it's clear that they're it's, not- It's really, it's happening almost behind the scenes, like yeah. automatically, you know. Exactly. Mm. And, and so being in synchrony together is actually a kind of releasing of the inhibition, right, that we put on our, our bodies, right? You're not, you, when you hear a beat, you don't just kind of, most of the time, you don't just kind of go to town dancing or whatever. You, you, you kind of, the, the urge might be there, but you have a whole lot of um, inhibitory control coming from the frontal cortex saying like, okay, now's not the right time to do this. Um, so, so you can hear the beat, your brain can process it and, and construct the beat, but you don't, you're not dancing to it necessarily. Yeah. And the, the loss of inhibition brings me back to examples like Haitian Vodou, where you have this <clears throat> ritual that's sometimes called transpossession. The practitioner is actually prefer the term ritual mounting, or like mm -hmm. you're mounting a horse there's this belief that during the drumming and the dancing that a spirit will mount you and you will become possessed. 
yeah. by that that individual spirit and you'll start acting and speaking like that spirit and different spirits will have different ways that they act yeah uh, there's like a peasant spirit where you'll actually act like a like a rustic farmer there's another spirit where you'll you'll act more like a snake dambala, dambala. Yeah. um so is this playing in with this idea of losing inhibitions like where does the ecstatic ritual and the synchrony come into play yeah i think that's exactly right that it's it's the loss of inhibitions is a big part of why I've never heard of a spirit possession religion that doesn't center on ecstatic music and dancing. I, I mean, there probably there might there be, might be, but it but, seems to be the common denominator. Yeah, yeah, because it's that it's it's that uh, release of those inhibitions that kind of you you just can really get into a a predictive trance, and I, uh, that's that's like I just made that term up, but what I mean is that. Most of the time, predicting what's going on around us, the brain's a prediction machine. You know, that's that's what we're doing with our brains all the time, and it's hard because we're different people. We have different personalities. We have different roles. We have different ages, genders, whatever. So, um, knowing what you're going to do at a precise level, temporally, a temporally precise level at any given moment is pretty much impossible. You know, I know that it's it's my brain has a very low expectation that you're going to jump up right now and and like flip the table, flip the table right like yeah. exactly but but you know in terms of like the next time that I'm going to pick up my cup and drink from it like you don't know you know um and so we have to think at a pretty high level a lot of the times to understand what's going on with other people to predict what they're going to do and it's a, it's it's a lot of cognitive work it's part of the reason why the brain uses um, I don't know the exact percentage. I want to say it's almost forty percent of our energy, of the total like glucose in our in our blood. It might not be that high, but it's way out of proportion to how much matter in our body it yeah. actually is, because it's doing all this work all the time. And then with rhythm, you come together in a dance, and then the prediction just like collapses in terms of how how complicated it is. You know that people are going to be moving at a certain rhythm. You don't, might not know exactly what they're going to do. Some people might move their arms more, some people might be moving more with their chest, whatever. But you know that in terms of what's going to happen, that there's something going to happen mm -hmm, yeah. on the beat each mm -hmm. time. And so you don't have to be doing, you don't have to be doing all this like top down um, cognitive processing. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of more of a bottom up thing. And that actually releases a lot of the, I think that can release a lot of the, the, the not just the normal inhibitions, but the normal expectations, mm. and that can that can that can lead to trance because you're not you're not kind of like filtering everything that comes in with such a high a high level of um, prediction and, and and model and like cognitive modeling. You're 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 just dealing with one pretty simple event, temporal repeated temporal event. So this is kind of what you mean by synchrony having a bonding effect right i think bonding is kind of an abstract term but sure. but but saying oh i know what you're going to do is more concrete like i know you're going to dance in this specific way because i'm dancing that specific way and both of our dance movements are going along with the music so it's it's bonding in the sense of kind of understanding what everybody you know everybody's on the same page as it were yeah i think that's a big part of the bonding effect is it's it's we all know how we're going to act at, or we all have a good idea that we're all going to be moving at a certain rhythm and that's satisfying for the brain it's actually rewarding you get a reward little reward shot in the brain each time one of your predictions is accurate you know um and and so you're it's a it's a mutually very rewarding experience to be all dancing together to the same beat, especially when you're really synchronized. Maybe if you've rehearsed, you know, and you all have the same moves going on. But even just you know at a dance party or something, if you're all dancing, that's that's a rewarding thing. To to be clear, we don't know exactly why or how synchrony produces all of the the social bonding, the gluing effects that it does. Um, it, part of it is the, probably the ease of prediction. Part of it is because it's the loss of inhibition. It's, it's just fun to be able to express right. something that, that, like an urge, an internal like impetus, you know, that, to move. Um, part of it might be um, just the shared activity. Any kind of shared activity is rewarding and bonding. There's one really interesting set of studies that showed that um, choir singing bond, bonds people much more quickly 
Whereas other kinds of activities, like shared crafts or things that we might be doing together, puzzles or whatever, bond people more slowly. But over time, they converge to the same level. So if you really want a, uh, your your friend group to be bonded, you know, dancing is one way, but, but doing singing together would be is like the shock shock to the system. Like you yeah. get bonded real fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. To go back to your question about what what's the evolutionary backstory for for music and rhythm, I think that 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 quickness is actually one of the keys to it because it sh it seems to it seems to sh show that music and synchrony are optimized for bonding people um, who maybe don't interact as much in in daily life. That's important because human groups, human beings, all of us, uh, regardless of our culture, have really complicated social systems. Even this, even even a, a, what we would call a non-state society, um, you know, living in a in in a pretty simple um, pre-industrial pre-industrial, right? Maybe even hunter gatherer, right? Um, can have extremely complicated kinship systems and clan networks and, and all kinds of like these overlapping subgroups that you can belong to. So you all belong to the same tribe, but I belong to the fox clan and maybe that guy belongs to the eagle clan. And then there are different subgroups in there. And we might have different initiation cohorts, right? Where I like everybody from age 12 to 16 gets initiated at the same time. And then they're all bonded together for the rest of their lives. So there's these cross-cutting sort of allegiances and, and rules that come with that, that make it, um, th that put lines, that put actually like lines of division in the, in the, in the overarching group. And so you might not actually be able to interact that much with members of this different clan. I mean, they might live in a different part of the forest, or there might be rules where you're not allowed to talk to your mother-in-law. That's a real thing. There's specific Northwest tribes in, in the United States where that's a rule. It's, you have to always go through an intermediary because it's rude to speak to your mother-in-law directly. And so um, those kind of rules about who can marry whom, who can talk to whom, who can live in the same place together, creates all these sort of subdivisions in, in a group. And music and dancing is a way that you can interact with people quickly when you come back together, right? In a, in a, in a, in a ceremony that brings the whole tribe together, the whole group together. Right, or, so you might be in these little atomized groups all over the region, but during a festival, you could all come back to the same area and participate in the dance. Yeah. and get bonded real quickly, even though you've been apart all year. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Or when two families that are that don't have much to do with each other um, have two of their kids get married, right? That's, you. what do you do at a wedding? You dance, yeah. and that's a way of kind of gelling two units that used to be separate and, and doing so very quickly, much more quickly than um, other kinds of activities yeah. would. I think, and I think that's actually a pretty key part of why our musical abilities, our rhythm, timekeeping, our ability to actually move our bodies in time with that rhythm that we hear, all those, those unusual abilities that other animals don't have. My hunch is that we wouldn't have those without language. That's not what many people argue. Many, many people argue that rhythm came first and actually developed, was kind of like a precursor to language, like some music came first, helped us to bond together, and then being bonded, we were able to start sharing intentions more and that led to language. That's that's kind of probably the more standard model or vision of it. My hunch is that it's actually either reversed or that uh, language and music, you, you can't disentangle them. That, that the, in part because that the rhythm abilities in the brain, that, that um, the rhythm, the timekeeping abilities that we have are really connected with the language centers um, and you need really precise temporal, and this is kind of a technical term, but you need really precise temporal resolution. So you need to be able to distinguish between different events, different audio events with a lot of precision in order to have language. Mm. You can't, you know, other animals also couldn't have language because they couldn't hear the difference between the t and the j in a, in a, in a right, because they come right. close too close together. But, so, yeah. but humans, we've developed that ability. Yeah. 
And that ability is also absolutely necessary for rhythm mm -hmm. and vice versa. So my, my hunch, again, is that these, these two uniquely human abilities are inseparable from each other. They evolve together. And that um, rhythm is actually a solution to many of the new problems that language offers us or, or presents us with. Because that's something that happens in evolution. Um, every new adaptation is, is a solution to a problem, right? But then it, provi it provokes new, new problems, language, yeah. exactly. And so language is a solution to a problem of abstract communication and coordination, you know, ability to plan forward and, and do things together. But it's also, it, it, it gives us this ability to create these like symbolic distinctions mm. in our societies and to have different roles that are at, that are much deeper right that are, are and more normative than the dis, than the different roles that um, a, a group of chimpanzees living together might have mm. so you, you don't have um, as much you, you have uh, well they, they call it a multi-level um, organ social organization humans have a really complicated multi-level way of living together that, that you actually need language for. And then, but in order to stay one group, you also need to be able to remember that you're all part of one group. And, and music and dance is a way to kind of re-gel, I think, um, and at, at, at intervals, you know, which is why dances happen, you know, at weddings or at seasonal festivals or things like that. Yeah, and this of course implicates more than religion. You know, I keep thinking of religion, but this you know, music and rhythm touch many different aspects of culture. Um, so I can see how this is something that you know it co-evolved with language, something that's uniquely human, and you know, religion also being this this very human thing. Of course, it would make sense that music and rhythm and dancing would make its way into religion or become part and parcel with it. Yeah, and I think that speaks to the fact that in most societies, there wasn't really so much of a distinction between those different spheres, that yeah. religion and government and, and economics. economics. Like we, we have these atomized spheres of culture, but yeah. that's all, in some respects a, a modern delineation. Yeah, exactly, especially with um, healing. That's another one that we, we've got medicine and we've got religion, but right. for most of human history, those have been the same thing. Yeah. You know, and and that that goes back to the, the way that music can create trance states. Um, when you're when you're in a trance state, you're probably quite a bit more suggestible. You can, and that's part of why uh, possession rituals, like in in um, Haitian Vodou, are you know you have you have so much emphasis on music because the the kind of constant repetition puts puts your brain into a trance state. And then you're suggestible to the idea that the spirit can come into your body. And, yeah, then and that you are now acting, your body is being used by the spirit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in other kinds of cultures, um, like Siberian shamanism, which is where we get the word shaman from the Tungus people, um, it's it's not possession. It's actually like it's like traveling. Like you, mm -hmm. you go into a trance, and then your spirit kind of moves into... Um, a higher plane where you interact with spirits. You don't, they don't possess you, but you like communicate with them and they tell you how to heal the person supposedly. So um, again, that's kind of a suggestibility thing. So with healing, um, a, lot of, a lot of healing, even for modern medicine is placebo effects, right? It's, we know that the placebo effect is very real, it's measurable. Um, it's, people are so easily affected by the placebo effect. The placebo effect, I'm assuming most of your listeners know about, but it's just the idea that when you think that something is medicine, regardless of whether it is, it can actually have positive effects on your, your body. So they test this in ways like giving one group of people sugar pills and another group of people actual Tylenol, mm. but telling them both that they're getting Tylenol and finding out what the difference, and then giving a third group nothing at all. Yeah. And the people who get the sugar pills have almost as much pain um, help with their pain as the people who got the real Tylenol. Not quite as much, but yeah. a lot more than the people who didn't get anything. So uh, that's that's kind of what a lot of healing was for the you know hundreds of thousands of years before modern medicine, or before even before herbal medicine. Mm -hmm. As is somebody's got a problem, and you might go into uh, you, you go to a shaman or whatever, and have a have a, a trance sort of state and then have have them say you know say words over you or whatever and then you, you might actually 
get real benefits from that at a physical level because of the placebo effect, because your body is, your, your mind and your body are kind of suggestible to that. Yeah. Right. And and something physiological is happening, like as you dance, like there are endorphins flowing, like you're like you said, inhibitions are going down. So there is something physiological happening. Yeah. But, you know, what's going on in our minds is always being affected by physical things mm -hmm. and vice versa. You know, so um, synchrony is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so to go back to the the, the question of religion, um, and, the, and the different kinds of rituals we talked about at the beginning, so some, some where there's different people doing different things, and then others where everybody's dancing together or sort of being in sort of rhythm together. The kind of rituals where people are, or the, the, the parts of rituals where there's different people doing different things, those help to, I would say, um, generally those, those are what help to increase the differences, to create those distinctions. You know, um, this person's a priest, this person's a deacon, this person is a lay person. Of, rituals create categories. I mean, that's, that's something that uh, Jay-Z Smith, uh, the... Super famous religious studies theorist. Yeah, yeah, with the beard. With the beard, big crazy beard. Eyes. Gandalf. Yeah, yeah, he is, uh, yeah very distinctive. Um, you know, he actually has a quote where he says, ritual it might not be exact, but ritual creates distinctions and difference. That's that's its main function. And, you know, that's not the same thing as collective effervescence in Durkheim's sense, where everybody's coming together and feeling the sense of unity. That's a very different sort of function. And it, uh, he's right that ritual in, in that kind of more differentiating way creates categories. It creates them and it reinforces them. You know, now is... Passover. Mm -hmm. Now is Yom Kippur, and that's Yom Kippur. You can't have Yom Kippur without this category of sin and the need for cleansing atonement, of the sin, yeah. atonement, exactly. So all these like ideas and categories kind of like emerge from the 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 parts of ritual that are about distinction and difference, mm -hmm. and that's those those rituals are what help create all those subcategories within the the, the the social group, you know, within the tribe or the community or whatever mm. that I was discussing earlier, those emerge from ritual. If you're a member of the Fox clan and I'm a member of the Bear clan or whatever, then you don't have those differences unless there are rituals that kind of reinforce them. Mm. You know, there might be initiate there might be different initiations for different clans. There might be different cohorts that kind of bond together and create those distinctions. And then when you need to transcend those distinctions, when you need to remember, oh, we're all part of one group, or we're, we actually do have a, a tight relationship, even though we have these category distinctions between us, the biggest category distinction in every human society always being male and female, right? That is gender distinctions and, and part of them are biological and part of them are culturally sort of constructed through rituals. Um, for example, there might be a different initiation, right? For girls than for boys, mm -hmm. whatever. There, there are ways that ritual creates these, these category distinctions that then need to be transcended sometimes in order to remember our common not our common humanity, that's that's because that's more of like a liberal humanist idea, right? But like our common like membership. Some, some broader membership category. Yeah. And yeah. synchrony is that tool to overcome that those distinctions. That is that what you're driving at? Yeah, that's that would be my my guess, you know, my hypothesis. Not not even my guess. I mean that that's my argument is that, that synchrony um, is specifically optimized for for transcending those those category distinctions and and creating a, a real felt sense of unity mm. it's not just abstract it's not a thing you're thinking about it's like you can actually see we're all dancing together it's yeah. a fact it's it's you can't lie about it mm. which goes back to Rappaport you know that, that ritual is something that makes it harder to lie mm. so most rituals will have a little bit of both, right? They'll have some part of the ritual that kind of reinforces the categories and the distinctions and the differences, and then they'll have parts of it that bring things together, um, and, and which is a which is a just something that you can expect in most kinds of complex systems that you're going to have some some aspects that are about segregating different parts, subcomponents, and some that are about reunifying um, to to keep the the whole thing. A unified whole. That's great. 
Well, I think that's all we have for today, but this sort of research just constantly impresses me that religious studies can be so capacious. We can talk about religious studies and comparative musicology in the same discussion. Yeah. But, uh, thanks for joining me, Connor. Thanks for having me, Andrew.